Support provided by Walters Papillon Thomas Cullens, LLC, specializing in business litigation and personal injury cases for over 40 years. Thank you, Lee. It's, uh, it's always great to be back uh, in this club, which I enjoyed being a member of for about 25 years, and I hated the fact that I couldn't make meetings uh, as much when I was in a different capacity, but it's always good to see uh, so many of you and a lot of new faces as well. Um, I do want to make, I'll make one comment in my official role as Commissioner of Administration just to tell you this. Uh, this budget that we've just completed, that the, uh, bud, the governor signed yesterday, and I don't think there were any vetoes in it, by the way, um, this legislature and the administration, for the first time in more than a decade, plussed up higher education, actually gave higher education more money than it got last year. That's a, something that hadn't happened in years. And, Provided a pay raise for teachers, as you know, provided funding for the first time for early childhood education, zero to three, not just uh, four-year-old programs, uh, and invested in the infrastructure of this state for the first time literally in 30 years, that there has not been uh, a significant amount of money as there is in the multiple millions of dollars going to our infrastructure. So uh, the legislature and the, it needs to be congratulated as well. And finally, in an election year, at a time we did have a little bit of money, things were a little more peaceful than they've been in the past where we were constantly talking about what revenue needed to be raised in order to make sure we didn't have to make drastic cuts. So, so that's the business end of things. Um, those of you from Mississippi, I've already heard from you. What I'm going to talk about today has nothing to do with putting down Mississippi. Um, I could have called this why Louisiana ain't Montana or why Louisiana ain't North Carolina. Uh, the point is uh, that I want to share with you is some things that you may not think about all the time about why our state is so unique, so interesting, uh, so wonderful of a place to live. It's because we're just not like uh, every other place. Now, when I was uh, Secretary of State, we had a university professor that was retired that did some volunteer work for us. And, um, I cast no aspersions on university professors. Uh, he was very confident, very sure of himself. He had all the answers. And uh, he and his wife celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary, and I had the good fortune of taking them to lunch the week afterwards. Uh, and making small talk around the lunch table, I asked the obvious question, what's the secret to 50 years of happy marriage? The professor cleared his throat as if to give me the obvious answer, but before he could utter a word, his wife said, we're both in love with the same man. <laughs> So, Madam President, ladies, uh, if the shoe fits at some point in time. Well, I, I tell you that story because I, I'm, I'm in love with Louisiana and love to talk about our rich history and what makes us so unique. And so I, I thought today I would share some of that with you. The presentation, Why Louisiana Ain't Mississippi, is actually about two and a half hours, a lot of music and stuff. I'm not doing it today, obviously. So this is just kind of a, a hint of what that's all about. But uh, if you think about... Louisiana culturally, you have to go back 3,500 years to understand how things started. 3,500 years ago, there were Native Americans flourishing in the northeast corner of Louisiana, what is now a very unpopulated, uh, poor area. Uh, but a little place that's now called Poverty Point, named after a plantation that came around years later. At Poverty Point, there were 10,000 inhabitants, Native Americans, who lived there. They were hunters and gatherers. They went out and got stuff and brought it back. There's no evidence of any agriculture there at all. But what they got in great quantity was dirt and mud from the Mississippi River, which was not too far away in the border uh, between Mississippi and Louisiana. Eight million bushel baskets of dirt. Imagine the engineering feat of transporting eight million bushel baskets of dirt to build the highest mounds in North America at the time. They still stand, a couple of them today. And a couple of years ago, this site became the 22nd place in America and only the 1,001 place on the planet to be designated as a World Heritage Site uh, because of the unique culture that existed there. These were Louisianians. They didn't know it at the time, but they were uh, the forebears of all of us. 3,500 years ago, Native Americans, obviously they got here first in most places in America. But if you fast forward to the mid-1500s, a Spaniard named De Soto discovered the Mississippi River. About 100 years later, a Frenchman named Robert LaSalle uh, 
came to explore this entire Mississippi River they'd heard so much about in Europe. Uh, La Salle started out in Canada, which was controlled by France, of course, at the time. He got in a boat in the northern part of what is now America. He sailed south, got out of his boat somewhere south of New Orleans, uh, put a French lily, also known as a fleur de lis, in the ground, as well as a cross, and christened this place Louisiana. Uh, not for some woman named Anna and some guy named Louis, but for his boss, King Louis XIV of France, who had sent him on this mission. So this Frenchman gave birth to Louisiana, and less than 10 years later, two intrepid French Canadians, whose names you will recognize, Iberville and Bienville, uh, came to this new world to explore this valley, this Mississippi River Valley that they'd heard so much about. Uh, they started out in Mobile and, and moved uh, westward, got to Biloxi, eventually got to Louisiana. They landed in Louisiana on Bienville's 18th birthday. Uh, it was also Mardi Gras Day, perhaps not so coincidentally. And Bienville became one of the first territorial governors of this new land. Uh, did a lot of very important things, including giving the first land grant in our territory's history to a fellow Frenchman named Saint-Denis who went north and founded Natchitoches, which is the oldest community in Louisiana. Uh, four years later, 1718, Bienville was responsible for founding New Orleans, New Orleans. A bunch of Indians led him through all the, road, the uh, waterways from the Gulf to Lake Pontchartrain to Lake Bourne eventually and uh, Bayou St. John and he founded New Orleans, the highest plot of ground they could find, which is now Jackson Square, and the first territory in the southern part of what would be Louisiana was formed. And so we've now got three ingredients in this human gumbo that makes up Louisiana. We have Native Americans, we have Frenchmen, we have Spaniards. Um, but that was not the end of it, but those were the kind of the roux and the gumbo that started Louisiana. Uh, what transpired next over the course of the late 1700s into the early 1800s was France and Spain swapped back control of New Orleans and this territory of Louisiana, a bunch of treaties and nobody really always knew who was in control down here, the French or the Spanish, but uh, it was one of the two of them that controlled New Orleans. And in the early days, Europeans came to America, not through Ellis Island. Ellis Island didn't come about until the early 1900s. It was through the port of New Orleans that Europeans came to this new world. And a lot of them stayed here, obviously. French came in multiple numbers in those early days. Spaniards came as well, but remember, they're already here. If you think about Mexico and think about Texas, Spain had control, and Florida, Spain had control of those areas early on. So there were already a big mix of Spaniards and Frenchmen and, and uh, Native Americans here. And then add another important ingredient to the gumbo, the, the group of Louisianians who didn't come here by choice, Africans, who came from the west coast of Africa, Gambia, Senegal, as slaves because slavery was part of the fabric of Europe. The Frenchmen and the Spanish who came over here were very used to slavery, and uh, they brought slaves into the New World through the port of New Orleans, which became the biggest slave trading um, center of America. And then add into this pot a number of other European groups that came after the French and Spanish first settled. Uh, Germans, Sicilians, they weren't Italians because Italy didn't exist at the time, but Sicily did. Sicilians and Germans uh, and Irish, all of whom came to the New World through the port of New Orleans, all of whom fanned out into America, but many of whom stayed right here and are identifiable even today in, in Louisiana parlance. You've got the German coast uh, down in the river parishes south of, of New Orleans. Uh, Hanville, named for a governor, a German governor of Louisiana named Han. Uh, Lake Des Almonds, Lake Des Almonds, the Lake of the Germans. That's where the Germans settled. And the Sicilians settled primarily New Orleans area south, but a lot of in Tangibahoe Parish as well. And if you look at the roster of elected officials in Tangibahoe Parish today, you will see a string of Sicilian names that won't end and they still are predominant today. So what began in the 1700s and 1800s is still a part of who we are today in, uh, in, in 2019. And then there's another group that came, uh, really not by choice as well. In uh, the late 1700s or mid 1700s, uh, a number of French people lived in Canada, in Lacadie, in Nova Scotia area. 
When the British won the French and Indian War, though, they decided that all these French subjects needed to join the Church of England and needed to become Protestant. Well, these folks were Catholic. Like most all these people who I've described already that came into Louisiana through the port of New Orleans, predominantly Catholics. And these Catholics in Nova Scotia, when they said, you know, you're going to just leave your church and join our church, they said, well, me no. I don't think so. They weren't going to do that, so uh, they, they resisted. And what happened next was a, really a genocidal expulsion of the Acadian people from Canada. It took nine years from 1755 to 1764 for those Acadian people to reach Nirvana, which was Louisiana. You think about it. These are fishermen, trappers, hunters. They're Catholic. They're very family-oriented, and they had been cast asunder. Husbands separated from wives, children separated from parents. But they stayed together as best they could, and they wound up coming to Louisiana, some through the port of New Orleans, some through the many other ports along the southern Louisiana border. And when they got here, they kind of got crowded out of the New Orleans area. They, they had to move south, so they, southwest rather. They moved into what we now know as Acadiana, the Cajun people. If you say Acadian real fast ten times, Acadian, 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 it sounds like Cajun. Eventually you get to Cajun. And these are the Cajun people who gave us our penchant for food and uh, humor and politics and everything else. We'll talk about that in just, just a minute. But So you got to put those French Canadians into the mix that made up early Louisiana as well. Um, so now we kind of move into the early 1800s. And remember France and Spain swapping control of New Orleans. Well, in 1803, the French had control of New Orleans. Thomas Jefferson, elected president, decides that America needs to expand westward. And to do that, he knows that he's got to control this port, this point of entry for everybody who's coming to the New World and the entryway to this massive river that's the river of commerce for this New World. And the river empties and enters America through only one state, ours, right? And so he knew he had to have New Orleans. So Jefferson sent a couple of pretty sharp cookies to Paris to negotiate with Napoleon to buy New Orleans. What happened next is kind of a microcosm of Louisiana politics. Our guys go over there with $10 million in their pocket to buy New Orleans. Well, as things would have it, Napoleon decides uh, he's going to give up on his dream of conquering this new world. Because, you know, he had, he's a megalomaniac. He's conquered everything in Europe. He had his eyes on the new world. But, no, he decided he wasn't going to do that. So he told his negotiators, just sell these Americans whatever they want. So instead of spending $10 million to buy New Orleans, our guys spent almost $16 million that they didn't have the authority to spend, by the way. Um, and they bought all or part of 15 states that would become 15 states in America. 825,000 square miles of land we buy. Now, you lawyers in the room, there was no title exam. <laughs> nobody knew what they were buying. Nobody knew what they were selling. And America borrowed the money to pay for the deal from England, and Napoleon used the proceeds of the sale to wage war against the lender. It's kind of the microcosm of Louisiana politics. <laughs> but in any event, the biggest real estate transaction in history takes place, and we don't call it the Jefferson Purchase or the American Purchase, right? We call it the Louisiana Purchase. That's what America wanted, that's what America needed, and that's what America got. And when that happened, Introduced into the society of Louisiana for the first time is the minority. They haven't existed heretofore, but here they come. White Anglo-Saxon Protestants, a lot of your forebears in this room. They weren't here before the Louisiana Purchase, but after the Purchase, as America started moving west, then a lot of these white Anglo-Saxon Protestants from Tennessee and Kentucky and Ohio and the New England area descend on Louisiana. And Imagine these big, hairy, burly, sweaty Americans with rum and whiskey and big barrels on their flatboats and keelboats tooling into the port of New Orleans. And you've got these very uh, sophisticated Creole people, French and Spanish and African and Native American living in New Orleans, and they look at these, these new guys in town and, you know, it doesn't jihad very well. They don't want any part of this. And so what happened, if you think about Canal Street, well, Canal Street was originally a canal. 
But you think about Congress, and I don't like to think about Congress, I know, but think about Congress, and um, it, what it often does is appropriate half the money needed to get a job done, and that's what happened. Congress had appropriated money to build a canal to drain what they knew was a low area, but they only appropriated half the money. So Canal Street became a street, not a canal. That's why it's so wide. But it was also the dividing line, uh, because what do we call that land in between your land and the public way? The neutral ground. Call it the neutral ground. Well, that was the original neutral ground. It was the neutral ground between the aristocrats on the French Quarter side of Canal and the Americans on the American side of Canal, which is now called the American sector. That's why. That's where all of them settled. All, they all settled. But now these white Anglo-Saxon Protestants kind of got squeezed out of New Orleans a little bit too, and so they had to look for land too. But most of the good land was already taken, so what did they do? They had to head north, right? So if you think about Louisiana today and Louisiana's population today, a lot of white Anglo-Saxon Protestants populating North Louisiana, much smaller population-wise than South Louisiana, and a lot of French and Spanish in origin and African Catholics living in South Louisiana. What was true then is true even today. And so uh, there's a reason for that. And the reason is where all these people came into Louisiana, for the most part, through the port of New Orleans and through the one entryway that is the only way to get into America. And it was significant back in the 1700s and 1800s, and it remains significant today, uh, even though we're all very threatened by the loss of that land that is represented along the coast of Louisiana, losing about a football field of land every hour and 10 minutes or so, and we're still trying to figure out how we're going to stop that or what we're going to do to try and slow that. But it's important to the people in uh, Shack Bay and Chauvin, but it also ought to be important to the people in Shreveport and Shongaloo and the people in Chicago and Sheboygan, because if we don't figure it out down here with the help of the federal government, we're not going to be able to supply America with the oil and gas that it needs and with the great seafood that it enjoys all over the world. We're not going to be able to maintain the, literally the finest and largest port system in the world when you consider all the ports along the Louisiana coast um, that is responsible for exporting 40 percent of the, the grain that's raised in America, for example, that everything comes down into Louisiana eventually because it's got to get out to the Gulf. So we got to figure out how that problem gets solved as well, and it's, it's very important that that happen. Um, so the reason Louisiana ain't Mississippi and the reason Louisiana ain't any other state is no other state has the ethnic mix that we have. Doesn't exist in South Carolina or Alabama or Mississippi. Uh, you don't have the degree of Catholicism that you have in Louisiana, and you don't have the rich mix of European culture that has identified Louisiana and made us a, a place that people want to see, people want to visit, and, and people will continually want to come to. And why we, we have a lot of pride in where we live. Um, Louisiana consistently ranks with Pennsylvania as the top two states of people who were born in their state who still live in their state. Despite all the out-migration that we've experienced, particularly with younger people, more people born in Louisiana stay here than virtually every other state. And there's got to be a reason for that as well, given all the challenges we have, all the negative things we hear about our state, people want to be here. People love the lifestyle, they love what Louisiana represents. Uh, we're this unique blend of religious zeal and joie de vie. That, kind of coexist, you know, they both, they're both just fine. Exemplified perhaps no better than a visit to New Orleans, Louisiana, where uh, this beautiful, magnificent St. Louis Cathedral stretches high in the sky, flanked by two historic buildings, one where the Louisiana Purchase was signed, and a doubloon's throw away is the den of debauchery that we call the French Quarter. <laughs> but the French Quarter, in some eyes, a den of debauchery, in other eyes, the most unique and preserved neighborhood in America because the French Quarter is a neighborhood and people live there as they remind people in the tourism industry all the time. But it is a neighborhood. Imagine what city in America wouldn't kill to have an area that has been preserved with the same buildings that were there literally in the 1700s and into the early 1800s. And by the way, the French Quarter isn't French. French Quarter is Spanish. Think about the design of the French Quarter. It's wrought iron and all the design of virtually every building in the quarter except 
uh, except the convent, the Ursuline Nun Convent, which is French in design. It's Spanish, all you architects, but it's called the French Quarter, but that's again the amalgamation of French and Spanish that came together and everybody got confused as to who was in charge when. <laughs> but in any event, um, this mix has created a very interesting political dynamic in the state of Louisiana through the years, right? And we have had some fascinating political creatures that have come out of Louisiana. <laughs> I don't have, I have, I have enough time to talk about a few of them with you and I want to do that because part of the fascination with Louisiana politics is driven by this very fact that I'm talking about of what this ethnic mix is. Um, it was absolutely unheard of in the 1920s that a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant lawyer from Wynn Parish, Louisiana could barnstorm through the state and get elected governor. How in the world is he going to get votes in Catholic South Louisiana? Well, he supported Cousin Ed Broussard for the Louisiana Senate a year before and that didn't hurt. And he got his identity here. But here comes Huey Long, this interesting character in Louisiana history um, who gets elected governor and immediately becomes a tyrant in many people's eyes. I mean, from the moment Huey got elected, you didn't have Republicans and Democrats, Northerners and Southerners, liberals and conservatives, blacks and whites. You had longs and anti-longs. You were with him or you were against him. You were rewarded or you were punished. It's exactly the way things went. 8,000 miles of muddy roads paved by Huey Long in the beginning years of his, his administration. Uh, dozens of bridges began construction, many of which still bear his name. Free textbooks for every child in Louisiana. Before Huey Long, if you wanted your children educated, you had to buy their textbooks. And all the while, 23 of his immediate family members were on the state payroll. <laughs> he was acting as a lawyer for whatever state agency was paying the most in legal fees. And he was collecting from every state employee 10% of their paychecks that went into his infamous deduct box. So named because it was deducted from their pay and used to support the campaigns of Huey's political allies. He insisted there was no coercion involved. <laughs> he said, and this is a direct quote, we make, him, we make them pay it voluntarily. <laughs> well, they, they did, they paid it voluntarily, but anyway, after about a year, the House of Representatives voted to impeach the sitting governor of Louisiana. The Senate didn't go along. 15 members of the Senate signed on to a document that became known as the Round Robin because they signed their names in a circle so nobody would know who went first. <laughs> but that document basically said, we the undersigned senators will not vote to convict Huey Long regardless of what the evidence shows. <laughs> so when the jury's made up its mind, you don't need to have a trial and Huey's impeachment trial ended as quick as it started in the old state capitol in, in Baton Rouge. But Huey was so dissatisfied with that whole process, he wanted a new state capital. There wasn't anything wrong with our old state capital, but Huey wanted a new one. And Huey got what he wanted usually. And so literally 14 months later, spending only $5 million, your state capital, your new state capital was built. Stretching 34 stories high, he wanted it to be the tallest State capital in America, it was and it still is, and it's also the tallest tombstone in America because he is buried right there in the front lawn overlooking the actions of every governor, every legislature since. Um, but he was just the beginning of our interesting legacy of care. I didn't mention one of the characters that preceded him, uh, Francis T. Nichols, whose name you recognize, for whom Nichols State University is named. He's a general in the Confederate Army. He goes into battle and he loses his left arm. He comes home and heals, goes back into battle, and loses most of his left foot. After the war, he decides he wants to get in politics, and he is elected governor of Louisiana with a very catchy slogan, all that's left of him is right. <laughs> so I guess he kind of set the tone for what would follow. Um, and then, you know, there have been a whole string of interesting characters we could talk about. I'll mention a couple of them. There was a, a famous sheriff in St. Landry Parish uh, named Cat Doucette. Uh, Cat Doucette could not speak English until, fluently until he was 19 years old. He spoke fluent Cajun French, but he hadn't mastered the English language until he was 19 years old. When he decided to run for governor, he decided he needed a coach to help him with his 
pronunciation, his diction, his choice of words. Not sure it, it helped. In one of his re-election campaigns, he pounded on the podium. He said, me, I'm going to win this race. I'm going to win by landscape. <laughs> he said, my opponent was there when he talked to you. He got all kind of things written down. When I talk, I talk out of my head. <laughs> and uh, during the course of his services, uh, Sheriff, he was asked it by a member of the press, Sheriff, what do you think about juvenile delinquency? He said, well, I, I don't know too much about it, but if it's good for the kids, I'm for it. <laughs> He said, uh, Sheriff, what do you think about the Civil Rights Bill? He said, if we owe it, we ought to pay it. <laughs> and then there was a, another character a little further south down the bayou named A.O. Rapalay. A.O. Rapalay claimed that he voted for Huey Long 18 times on the same day. <laughs> he probably did. As a former Secretary of State, I want to assure you that's not the way we do it anymore. But. <laughs> Rapalay uh, always had opponents. He was always in some kind of hot water. Things were happening or whatever. And so he was up on a podium like this in one of the re-election campaigns. All the candidates were lined up, and they all got up to speak, and they were trashing Rapalay. And he finally got his chance to speak, and he got up and he said, that man over there, he's saying some terrible, terrible things about me. They're not true. They're not true. But when you go vote, if you think I'm such a bad man, you put an X by my name. <laughs> people did <laughs> and he sailed back into office <clears throat> and then the the last uh, person I'll, I'll talk to you about is one of my all-time favorites and um, he was elected to the Louisiana House of Representatives in 1924 uh, subsequently elected to four or five terms in the Louisiana State Senate ran for governor unsuccessfully twice because Huey Long and after Huey's death Huey's allies made it their business to make certain that Dudley J LeBlanc rose to no position higher than state senator. Uh, Huey and Dudley had been rival patent medicine salesmen in the 19-teens. Uh, Dudley sold something called Dixie Dew cough syrup, and Huey sold a couple of different things. One of the things was called Cotyline, and they were just rivals. They didn't like each other. Well, Dudley decided he could build a better mousetrap, so he went back to his family's camp around Lake Panur, Lafayette, Vermilion Parish area and started concocting his own patent medicine, which of course became known as Hadacol. Why did he call it Hadacol? Had to call it something. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not right. He, he did, he had to call it something, but he took the first two letters of the words in his business, the Happy Day Company of LeBlanc, Hadacol. Now, Hadacol was 12% alcohol by volume. A little bit of vitamin B1 and a bunch of elixirs mixed in that gave it a very medicinal look and flavor. It was sold in some places in the pharmacy and other places in the bar room. <laughs> but it was sold in great quantity because of Dudley's marketing genius. He was the first guy to put uh, his company logo on the side of a big 18-wheel truck and drive it out in the countryside to deliver the bottles of Hadacol. He would have sent postcards to everyone in the area before the truck arrived, entitling them to a free box bottle of Hadacol. So by the time the salesman got there, the pharmacist or the bartender said, man, give me everything you got. People are clamoring for this stuff. Dudley created something called the Hadacol Caravan. It was a traveling road show uh, that performed in civic centers, arenas, high school gymnasiums, literally across the country, mostly the southern part of the country, but all over the country. Everybody who was anybody in show business at the time was part of the Hadacol Caravan. Jack Benny, Bob Hope, Dorothy Lamour, Lucille Ball, Minnie Pearl, Mickey Rooney, you name it, everybody who's anybody is in the show. The only way you got into the show was to clip the coupon off the box that contained the bottle of Hadacol. And Dudley used to say, if you don't like the show, I'll give you a coupon back. <laughs> it didn't matter by that, that point in time, but everybody loved the show. Dudley became a national celebrity. He was invited to be on the Groucho Marx show, You Bet Your Life. And Groucho welcomed him. He said, uh, well, Santa, welcome. What exactly is Hadacol good for? And Dudley said, didn't bat an eye. He said, well, Groucho, last year, about $5 million. <laughs> <laughs> by the next year, it was $25 million. By the time the FTC came in and shut down the production of Hadacol, <laughs> Dudley had sold the business and pocketed a small fortune. Well, what was Hadacol good for? 
the promotional brochure that came with the bottle of Hadacol said this, that Hadacol cures, cures <laughs> cancer, <laughs> tuberculosis, diabetes, paralysis, epileptic fits, delirium tremens, neuralgia, migraines, arthritis, rheumatitis, high or low blood pressure, <laughs> <laughs> and that rundown condition following colds. Well, it did nothing of the sort, but at 12% alcohol by volume, it didn't much matter. Mamas would give it to babies in little droppers, put them, knocked them out, just like that. But Dudley's real genius was that he marketed how to call not so subtly as an aphrodisiac. Before all the pills we see advertised on TV night after night and all the magic formulas that are out there today, it was how to call. It was going to put a little pep in your step. It was going to improve your love life. Uh, lest you doubt it, I don't have the song to play for you, but um, Hank Williams, who was also part of the Hadakal Caravan, performed a song called the Hadakal Boogie. And the Hadakal Boogie was Dudley's not so subtle way of marketing Hadakal as an aphrodisiac. The first, I'm not going to sing it, but the first verse said, Down in Louisiana in the bright sunshine, they do a little boogie woogie all the time. They do the Hadakal Boogie. The next verse was this. I went down to the farm to rest about a week, but the farmer's wife, she started walking in her sleep. She did the Hattie Call Boogie. <laughs> or the next verse. If your radiator leaks and your motor stands still, give her Hattie Call and watch her boogie up the hill. <laughs> and the, the bass guitar player for Jerry Lee Lewis, and Jerry Lee Lewis also has a a version of Hadakal Boogie on his one of his CDs, Last Man Standing, but Jerry Lee's favorite verse is not on that album or on that uh, CD, but it was this. It takes a knock-kneed woman and a bow-legged man to do the Hadakal Boogie on a sardine can. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I can't make this stuff up. I mean, this is, this is for real. So, you know, the long list of characters in Louisiana politics who have had success and others who haven't had as much success all goes back to the interesting ethnic mix that makes up the Louisiana electorate. It's unlike any other place in the world, and that's why Louisiana ain't Mississippi. Uh, two years ago, and I'll, I'll close with this, the magazine Nat Geo Traveler, one of the National Geographic publications, a travel magazine, had a cover story that was called The Weirdest Country in America. And, and I knew what was coming, and uh, <laughs> open it up, it's a six-page spread all about Louisiana, the weirdest country in America. But the headline said it all, I think, and this was the headline, homegrown, unique, and thoroughly wonderful, Louisiana has a character all its own. Yeah. And we do. We have characters all our own, but we do have a character all its own, and, and we as Louisianians oftentimes are our own worst enemies, and we ought to be the biggest ambassadors that we have for our state and not leave it to the people who visit our state to be our greatest ambassadors. Unfortunately, in many cases, they are, because seldom does anybody come here and say, man, I never want to go back there again. It's usually I can't wait to come back to the place we call home. So uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to, to share that with you, and congratulations on your reign. Support provided by Walters, Papillon, Thomas Cullens, LLC, specializing in business litigation and personal injury cases for over 40 years.